All right, so Peter's just, he's just getting cooking here in the letter, still getting warmed up, and he's going to start transitioning into the main body of the text. And so a lot of people see these verses here as something of like the theme of the letter um, and what Peter's trying to ground us in as he moves forward to deal with all the heresies and the errors that come next. So throughout the next chapters, he's going to deal with grievous errors uh, concerning Christ, concerning the gospel, concerning the Christian life. And so everything he's been doing in chapter 1 here, grounding us in this way of godliness, is preparing us against that. And so that's what he's continuing to do here. And he's going to emphasize it kind of on a personal note in these verses here. Okay, So we'll just have three points from the passage. First, the truth. Peter's reminding them of the truth that they already have, but he's encouraging them to walk in it all the more, as often Scripture does for us. So first, the truth. Secondly, the tent. Peter refers to his own death and leaving his own body. And uh, you probably got a footnote in your Bible there because the word body there is actually the word for tent. And so it's a wonderful picture of when we're in Christ, how we can view this, the tempor temporal nature of this life. So the tent. And Peter's about to die. He's about to leave that. So. And then third point will be the time. Peter's looking ahead. When that time comes, the Lord told him it will come. When he leaves, he wants to make sure that these believers can always recall and look back and remember the things, the most important things that he's been pressing upon us as he's been doing these last few verses. Okay. I feel like that was longer than usual intro there. The truth, the tent, and the time. And then we'll try to apply it. Okay, first the truth. So Peter's saying, therefore, because what he's been saying is the, the holy cauldron of remembrance and effectiveness in the kingdom that he said there a few verses ago, that he told us make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and then finally brotherly affection with love, those seven ingredients there. And last week what he told us is when we walk in those ways, we're growing in those ways, we're focusing on those ways and cultivating that prayerfully, asking the Lord to bless us. When we do that, he says that keeps us. There's a promise there. We will never fall away from Christ if we walk in the motions of those, those steps of holiness or those ingredients to supplement and build up our holy faith. And we will have that assurance because our faith will be strong. And in this way, the kingdom's doors will be flown wide open for us. Okay. So therefore, because of that, because that's so true and so sure, and there's so many promises there, Peter says he intends always to remind us of these qualities. So as long as Peter has breath, as long as he's remaining, he's going to continue to admonish and point to those very basic things. All right. He uses the phrase, he, he's reminding, he uses throughout this passage. And so uh, I titled the sermon, um, Remind Craft. It's not bad. Um, <laughs> Peter's basically trying to forge out this, you know, like that, that list of the seven ingredients. It's like he's kind of formed this unit to give to them this form of sound words that they can carry with them. And it's not a bad thing to memorize, just those seven ingredients there. It can be done. It can remind us ways we can supplement and grow. But Peter's kind of hammered it out into that form, you know, like the crafting table in Minecraft. Just put those ingredients in there. Make sure you add all the ingredients or the magical portal to heaven's glories will not open. So you've got to make sure you have all of them there. And Peter's bringing us into remembrance. Anyway, it just reminds us that the Christian faith is, is so focused on the mind. And much of the Christian faith draws from that battlefield of the mind, taking control of the mind, and growing in God's truth, in a, as we've seen, in a deliberate way, in a hands-on type of way, that we want to grow and supplement. And so a lot of it has to do with remembrance. The Christian religion just happens to be a religion of truth and knowledge. And so all Christians are called to this, the exercise of knowing the truth and sharpening our minds and girding up the loins of our mind. And in this way, bringing to remembrance these basic truths, we always need to be brought back to them. 
And so the, really the Christian memory here is on display and it's, a, it's something we can all grow in to keep the truths of God before us as clearly as possible. And Peter's really helped us out by giving us that little nugget there. Um, that's what these things are then. That's what we're saying. These qualities. I, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. That's that list of seven ingredients that he added to our faith there. Um, it's possible also that Peter has in view this whole letter. This is his final letter. It's got that vibe of like a last testimony or last word, deathbed kind of word utterance that he's giving. And so not just these last few verses, but the whole letter is going to have that feel, that urgency, and sort of that, that simplicity of focus on the major things, things that are most important so we can clearly focus on them. And so it's the mind, and he's reminding us and bringing it to remembrance. He says here that he's doing this not because we don't know these things or because we don't have them, but because we do. Christians know this. Christians have this. Christians walk in these things. Whether you know it or not, as a believer, these things are at work within us. And, you know, God's going to see to it that we're growing. Peter's encouraging us here to get hands on so that process can go more quickly. We can have more assurance, more confidence before God as we face the day of God to come. It's all theme of the letter there and the judgment. Um, but he's really been encouraging us there. We already have it. Paul talks like this too. You know, it would say, when something's going well, you kind of want to focus on it and make it go better. I, I, you know, those areas of, in our lives where we're strong at, those things that come naturally to us or skill sets we have that just kind of flow that we're good at, that's where we want to, generally speaking, you know, that's the wisdom, to focus on those things where we're growing or where we're strong. And so as Christians, all the more, as we grow mature, we want to focus all the more then on stirring these things up and bringing them out and growing in Christ. He says an interesting phrase here. He says, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. Um, he talks about the possession of these things that believers have. All right. And um, they have been brought to us. Or they are present with us. This amazing thing about the Christian faith is it, it's, it's word. Is a word and it can be spoke it's spoken as word and it flies as a word and it's quick as a word and it's close as a word can be to us that's the form it comes in yes in the old testament they had you know the rituals and the ceremonies that pictured these things but now that we've come into the full revelation of god's truth it takes place there in the invisible realm of truth and as such that truth is with us can I remind you of what Paul quotes Moses there from Deuteronomy when he says, this word is not too difficult for you. It's not in heaven that you've got to climb up and try real hard to get it or be full of holiness and be really, really good and then you can attain this word. He says, it's not under the sea where you've got to go down into Hades or suffer. If you suffer and go real low, that then somehow you can get this gospel word. He said, the word is with you. It's near you. It's on your tongue. And Christian truth is like that. We carry it with us. It goes with us always. We have our physical Bible, so we may learn those things, but that truth is with us always, even if our physical Bibles were taken away. Even if we only went off the memory we had of the things God has promised us, they're still in our hearts. He still worked them into us. And so much of the Christian life is, sometimes, you know, we do learn new things. Sometimes you come into a new doctrine. But not always. A lot of times, mostly the Christian life is just those things we already know, but growing further in them, understanding them more, appreciating them more, and being established, firmly rooted in them more and more and more. Just as a mighty tree grows, the more the tree grows and the more the roots sink in, the more difficult it is to upend that tree. So same thing with us. He wants us in these things. Clear and present truth is with us. It's amazing. Okay, this kind of leads to the second point then, the tent. So what he's saying is, he, as long as he's here, he wants to remind us of these things, <clears throat> and he thinks it's right, as long as he is in this body. Because he knows that the time of putting off his body is coming, and he won't be with them forever. And so just as the truth deals with the mind, and that the soul, and our hearts are part of that too, our whole invisible selves, this point here that Peter makes about his body and death to come, it sort of reiterates that fact. 
that the Christian truth is all about nourishing that spiritual self. It's all about growing in the invisible person. And Peter understands that's what he is because his present body in this fallen world, he calls it a tent. as a temporary dwelling place. And it's pretty flimsy at that. And so he knows he's quickly about to put that off, but he knows that he himself, the true Peter, will fly to glory and be with God. And it reminds us of the fact that the Christian faith, the kingdom of God that's in our midst, is a very invisible thing that we partake of invisibly in the hidden person. And no one can see that hidden person except God and us as far as we understand ourselves. And sometimes we don't understand ourselves. So well, and the Lord knows that truly. But you can't see that invisible self, that person who you are. If you think, who am I? You know, the bodies we have, they are our bodies. They're part of us. And even though when we die, our bodies go to the ground, at the end of time, we'll get bodies back, resurrected bodies. We were made and designed to inhabit our bodies, and our bodies are part of who we are. That's true. But our true self is an invisible reality. And Peter's concerned about that invisible reality to give us that invisible truth. And so we can just keep our heads in the game, as he's been telling us in the last letter, too that the time is short and the place we're in is not home because it's tent it's a tent it's a tabernacle so um i just love that picture of the tent because a tent is not something you set up as a permanent place it's as you're passing through and it's not made to be permanent and you'd be a fool to try to make a permanent and long-standing home in a tent. You need houses for that sort of thing. And yet Peter's saying that our lives in this world, our present lives, as stable as they can be and, and how well they can go sometimes, both spiritually and earthly, in an earthly way, it's all good. But at the end of the day, it's such a temporary thing and we would be foolish to put our stock and hope and focus in this life because it can be taken away so easily and it will be taken away for all of us. And all of us will soon shortly at some point in time, and it won't be truly long for any of us compared to eternity, we will go. And we will leave behind this vessel and we will step out into eternity. And that's why being in Christ is so very important. We want to have that mental um, attitude or perspective on things, of that eternal perspective on things that Peter's been encouraging us with the tent. You know, uh, it's, if you go camping, I'm not too much of a camper. I haven't been lured in yet. But, um, <laughs> you know, you go camping, but you do that for a time. You know, you go have fun for a couple days of your week or whatever you're going to do. But it's just a short part of your year or your lifetime. The thing of the camping trips is just a short little thing. Boom, boom, boom. And you, remember, you think back upon it either fondly or with regret, depending if you like camping or not. But it doesn't last very long. It's a short thing. And that's what our lives are. We see again, like it's an example. We know that truth, right? What Christian doesn't know that truth? But it's different to really let it sink in or walk in it or weave it as part of who we are to have that eternal perspective. Because it matters when sin comes knocking on it, crouching at the door and temptation comes for us and it offers pleasure or whatever in earthly life, we can see that's such a temporary thing, it's not worth. It produces no eternal rewards, eternal destruction and only very temporary, call it a reward of sin or payment of sin. So it keeps us in that perspective. It's very good. The tent. Um, Paul talks about this, contrasting the tent he says, when our tent is destroyed, this is 2 Corinthians 5, the tent of our present body is destroyed. He says, that's okay, because we have a house built from God. So, <laughs> so the contrast with our present earthly bodies and the glorified bodies we will have is the difference between a tent, can be nice tents, tents can be lovely, beautiful things, but they are very flimsy and temporary. And in the life to come, our bodies will be those houses that, now, you know, what does that mean? Can't really tell you. Don't really know. It sounds pretty good, though. We don't know what it'll be like. 
But I think as we, you know, th those of us, those of you guys in the congregation who are more advanced in wisdom than the rest of us could probably tell us a little bit about what it's like when that tent starts to get just a little bit rickety, you know? And you feel it as you just get a little bit older and older and you get injuries and, you know, you sleep the wrong way or you just sneeze the wrong way and you get older and it's just like, man, it needs attention. Okay, well, that's reality. No point in hiding from that. Peter's embraced that. Peter knows he's about to die. And he's about to leave that tent behind. And he's going to go be with Christ until he gets his new body, which will be the house. Praise the Lord. Can't wait for that. Okay. Uh, there's probably another idea here, though. The idea of a tent is, in the Bible, that's meaningful. It's the idea of a tabernacle. So remember the Old Testament, the children of Israel come out of Egypt, they're traveling through the, the wilderness. As they're doing so, God is with them, and He has them construct the tabernacle, which was the tent of worship. And so they didn't have a permanent temple yet, because they were going through the wilderness on their way to the Promised Land. But whenever they'd stop, the Levites would set up the tent in very orderly fashion. Everything was as it should be, and it was pretty extravagant, and a lovely uh, orderly worship that took place because God sat on the throne of mercy in the midst of his people and he gave mercy to them. It's a wonderful, amazing thing. But it was temporary. It was a tent. It had goat's hair, you know, throw the goat's skin over it and all the rest. And tent, you know what I mean? Um, and that symbol of God's presence with them in their wanderings. All right. When you get to the New Testament, you have that idea it's fulfilled in Christ. In John chapter 1, Jesus says that the, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, but the Word is tabernacled among us, tented among us. That just as God in the Old Testament took up His presence amongst the people, so too for all humanity, God the Son, the God-man, has taken up His residence. He took up His tent. He dwelt among us in real life. He was here. And he took up that abode in his body, which was a tent, because even for Christ, that tent had to be put off. And that's how he, you know, won our salvation, through the destruction of that tent, his body and his blood broken and shed for us. But the idea there is of God's presence in that temporary structure. And, you know, for Peter, this is also true. This is why Peter wants to leave behind these remembrances, because Peter understands there is a light shining from him. There is a Shekinah glory there, or a light of truth that he has, because he's Peter. It's Peter the Apostle. And there's a difference there between Peter and us. You don't, there's no more apostles. They're not coming back. We're not getting any more of those guys. Those stupendous miracle workers, utterances of new revelation from God, the apostles, the twelve foundation stones, the twelve apostles of the Lamb, have set the foundation for the church once and for all. Peter was one of these guys we've seen. Peter's like the first guy, the original, call him the original apostle. And so Peter, the light is about to go out for him. And all the truth he carries and bears that truth he got directly from Christ is about to go with him unto glory, so he wants to leave that behind as his tabernacle is being put out. And certainly there's truth for us there. We'll try to apply that to ourselves in the end here. The tent. Um, Peter knows this is going to happen, and this leads us to our third point, the time. He says, I know that the putting off of my tent will be soon, as our Lord Jesus made clear to me. Peter, you know, famous knucklehead. Some difficulties, you know. Uh, we're all like that in many ways. We're all very much like Peter. Takes us a long time to learn the lessons. How many times I gotta teach you this lesson, old man? It's what we have to face constantly. And so we all struggle in those ways. Um, and Peter says here that Christ told him when he was going to die. And you're probably thinking of at least one passage in the Gospels that mentions Peter's death. John 21, um, the end of John's Gospel. There became that, you know, that little rumor that 
John the Apostle would live, you know, until Christ's return. And uh, I remember Peter was upset about that. And so the Lord turned to Peter. Remember, he asked him if he loved him and feed my sheep and that bit. And then he tells him that the time will come. When he, when he was young, he got to dress himself, you know, got to get his own drip, whatever he liked, and to go wherever he wanted and did whatever he did. But the time will come when he would be dressed by another and he would be led to a place he didn't want to go. And it says there that this signified the kind of death by which Peter would glorify Christ. And that death, we know, from church tradition at least, death of crucifixion. So Peter's known his entire ministry since that time that he would die in the service of Christ in some way. That he would meet that martyr's end. Okay, so he's known that. And it's probably true also since he's an apostle that Jesus has been t reminding him this since that. He probably, these guys talk to Christ openly in that way. Jesus appearing to these guys and speaking with them, having just open conversations with them. And so Jesus has probably been reminding Peter or probably been nudging him or letting him know, hey, you remember that little prophecy about your death? That time's coming up. And he could probably tell that with the persecution, everything going on in Rome. According to some scholars, you know, by this time, Paul had already died. Paul had already been martyred by this time, so Peter's waiting his turn. So, um, he knows that this is about to happen. And the time is approaching. And Peter is very wise. That's why he's eager. That's why he, he wants to make the best use of the time. Because he understands the time is coming when he'll be gone. And even though he gets to go be with Christ and enter into the splendors of heavenly fellowship in paradise, which will be amazing, he's still concerned about them after he leaves. He wants them to be safe and taken care of after he's gone. And that's why we have this letter. It's true for all Christians. He's left behind this testimony and these things for us. And so that's the prophecy. And so what he says is, what he wants to do, is verse 15, I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. So he wants to work hard so it's easy for us. That's how it really should be in ministry. It's like you go to a restaurant. You don't want the chef just throwing out these raw ingredients to you and trying to have you assemble it. The whole job of the chef is to go out of the way to make that meal absolutely ready to eat with ease. And so Peter's seeing it that way. He said, I want to work so hard in the ministry of truth that for y'all it's an easy thing. And you know, that's what it's like. The, the books that are easiest to read or the teachings that are easiest to understand are usually from, they appear easy, but work through much difficulty and preparation. And Peter's like, I'm, I want to be that cat who goes out of the way to keep it simple for you so you can always remember it and bring it to mind. In other words, for instance, he's saying, timeless truths, he wants to leave them at our fingertips. So it's easy. Why? So that we can neutralize all the heresies and errors that he's going to be dealing with and that we will be dealing with in various ways in our Christian life, and he's going to cover the rest of the letter. Okay, so that's the point here. He's laying this foundation. You've got to have this, the potion, right? The holy potion of all these holy ingredients so that our faith can grow strong and we'll be ready to face it. And also so these temptations and errors come our way and it will, it, will, it will neutralize them. It will undo their power and effect and it will keep us, as he said, from falling into them. So, all right, the truth, the tent, and the time. Let's try to apply it real quick. So first application. Let's enjoy the truth we have. To be a Christian means we have the truth. We continually grow in the truth and we want to sharpen in the truth and we want to add to the truth through Scripture and good teaching of Scripture. But we have to recognize that as believers we've been born of the Spirit and God has put His law upon our hearts. He's just stamped His holiness upon us. And every Christian understands the general shape of that. And that's the kind of thing he's been telling us here, add to these, these ingredients of holiness and sanctification. It's the general shape of what it means to be a godly person. And everybody knows that in Christ by instinct. We know that. So we find that echo of the truth. So as we read Scripture and as we hear these things, it only builds up what we already know. John said something like this, by the way. He said, that not that they need teachers. You don't need anyone to teach you in First John. He said, you already established the anointing teaches you. So in that sense, we have access to the truth of Christ and the gospel directly. Because it's been written on our hearts. But we need the lamp of scripture and the sword of scripture to continually sharpen that up and brighten that up and grow into it. But it's there in raw form, let's say. 
and ready to grow at all times. And he wants it just to be that much quicker and easier so that we know it. Okay, so we enjoy that truth. That's what he said. It's present with us. We have it. The truths of God are not unattainable for any Christian. Anyone with faith, just like the, the, the sick and the lepers in Christ's day, you don't have to be a special person to be healed. Anyone with that access to Christ, even touch the fringe of the garment, we saw that Bible study, even that was enough, boom, to bring that healing and grace. Same thing for Christian. No Christian truth is out of our hands. It is but the touch of faith that brings it to us and makes it ours and you know obliterates the imposter syndrome. How could I, this truth, this is for the theologians or this is for the really godly people or the people that have suffered or have been with Christ for a long time. No, it's for everybody. Truth of God for every Christian. Let's enjoy that. We have that and we're growing that. Second application, let's live wisely in our tents. So Peter's demonstrating to us the kind of mentality we want to have as we live in tents. Because he's just worried about it, you know, his neighbors. You know, like a good neighbor, the apostle Peter is there. Stick his head out the tent and remind us of the truth. And to live wisely while we're in the tent. And we want to mimic that. We want to grow in these, in these ways of holiness so that we can live wisely while we have this time. Because there's other people in tents next to us that don't know Christ. Tents that when their tent perishes, they too, their soul will perish as well. So we want to have these things ready and be able to minister these things. And live wisely, just like Peter's living wisely for the sake of others. And building up other Christians. And then third application. Let's leave something behind. That's what Peter's doing here. He's worried about leaving a legacy of some sort. Something behind, some reminder, some help, so when he can't reach beyond, down back to time and space from heaven, that at least the truth and the deposit is there. And so that mentality is true for all Christians. Though. We have to think like that as we grow as believers, that we would leave that impression of truth behind us. Especially true in places of leadership. So, you know, it's our closest relationships where we're going to leave those things behind. You know, spoiler alert, none of us are ever going to have as sweeping of a reach as the Apostle Peter and his ministry. We're not going to leave that kind of dent in this world. It's not going to happen. But every Christian leaves that mark behind in those they walk with in their local church or in their household or amongst their friends or with their children, with their spouse, etc. And we want to live in such a way and handle the truth of God in such a way that there's that remembrance when we're gone. We leave that legacy behind. You know, parents, we feel that we feel that all the time. Man. If I was a dad, so much more I want to teach my children. But we think about that for each other and for serving Christ in the local church with other believers. That it goes beyond family. It goes to everybody. That mindset of leaving. So we can download Peter's truth here, the form of truth that he's crafted for us, and we can begin disseminating that too to those around us. And uh, I think that's really encouraging, leaving that behind. Because, and on this note, these heresies are coming, these false teachings are coming, these ideas that aren't true, but Peter's main concern is not first and foremost for us to be able to rebuke those errors, we do want to be able to correct them. But the defense against them is not just that answer of truth, but it's that godly life. As we grow in this godly life, the godly life itself refutes the error. Because it, that, the error doesn't compute with that. So these false teachers are going to come along in chapter 2 and tell us we can do all these things. We're free to do all these things we thought were sinful, but actually they're okay. Well, you hear that, and it doesn't jive with the list Peter just gave us. So if that's in place, it's like studying the dollar. Study the genuine article, and then you can recognize the forfeit. So anyway, just those practical benefits to walking with Christ in a godly way. Pretty awesome. We'll find these encouragements as we go. Okay, let's pray. Father, please help us to submit ourselves to your truth and to walk in the richness of your promises, that we would grow in godliness, that, we, that error and sin would lose, lose power in its temptation upon us, that we might be fortified and strengthened against it, that we might enjoy the truth, enjoy your fellowship, enjoy each other, love each other, and love all people for your sake. So please help us. And be with anyone here who doesn't know you, Lord. May they reach out and grab that present truth and believe.
pray in Jesus' name. Amen.